are truly a handful of people in the podcast world who have voices and personalities that are absolutely imprinted on my heart and brain. And maybe I'm way too addicted to podcasts, but uh, Phoebe Judge, the host of Criminal, is one person that really comes to mind. If you've ever listened to Criminal, free plug for that podcast, but holy crap, she is just one of the best voices to listen to. Um, And another person who is just really unique in their sound and in their delivery that is in the podcast world is my guest this week. She hosts one of the most popular parenting podcasts in the world and created a massive viral challenge to encourage families to spend more time outdoors with their kids. Multiple times a week, she interviews different game changers and experts who specialize in children, parenting, nature, and learning. And I have learned so many new things because of her podcast. I've also gotten a lot of book recs, and I'll talk about that in a second. She's a homeschool mom of five. She lives in Southeast Michigan. And she has really changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of families with her fun and countercultural initiative to prioritize nature over screens. And what I was saying, she is the biggest bookworm that I know. And you know, if you follow me, I am like a massive reader, but she is known for being a reference encyclopedia. I lost count of how many times she name dropped different books in this interview. So if you are also a huge reader, especially when it comes to the parenting and child development genre, keep your phone notes open and then just jot down all of her recs. She is such a delight and mom inspo for me personally. Please welcome Jenny Urich, the founder of A Thousand Hours Outside, to The Spillover. Jenny, I cannot tell you how full my heart is to be able to interview you. You are such a talented interviewer. Like, I could listen to you interview a brick wall, and I would be so entertained. Your podcast, I think it's also super good for distress, uh, de-stressing, which I think is funny. I think it has a lot to do with probably your voice. But did you ever think that you would be hosting one of the biggest parenting podcasts Aww. in the world? No. <laughs> no, never. Can you even imagine... But what a cool life. And I think it's cool not to know the end. I think it's cool not to know where you're going to end up. It makes life a lot more fascinating and exciting. You are traveling all over the country. You speak a lot. You're talking to moms. How are moms doing really right now? Moms are burdened. And I was a burdened mom. So basically what I'm doing is just sharing my story, sharing something that worked for our family in answer to a lot of modern day parenting problems, but just a lot of modern day problems as well. I think that moms are burdened. And I also think that moms are unsure of themselves. What should I be doing with my time? How should I be raising our kids? And so it makes everyone just a little shaky. But I think that in time over over the course of my motherhood and just over the course of my life, I have found that, man, it's the easiest things sometimes that make such a simple, like a, a big difference to the simple thing can make such a massive difference in your life. Like, for example, I think if you put out a tablecloth, it makes a it makes a party, right? It makes things really exciting. And so there's these little things sometimes that really can make a difference. And outdoor time has done that for our family. Outdoor time has pretty much changed your family's life. I mean, everything it yes. it, it, it has created an entire career for you. <laughs> <laughs> what revelations have you been seeing lately in the parenting space? Like, are there any huge mindset or worldview changes happening recently? Well, here's what's changing. Change is changing. And Neil Postman has a book called "Amusing Ourselves to Death," where he talked in nineteen in the nineteen eighties about television and how that is really affecting culture. Well, then he said, change changed. So we used to have change that was, everything's always changed. Life has always changed. But in the past five, 10 years, it's changing more rapidly. And so all of a sudden, we're in a position where we have to decide, how are we going to raise our children? How are we going to prepare them for a rapidly changing world? Now, here I sit, right, Alex, with a podcast. Well, let me tell you, I was a math major. And I taught high school math. That was my career. I taught piano lessons. I taught swim lessons. And now I sit talking to you. Our lives have these paths that weave and they and they twist and they turn. And in decades prior, people would have a career for 30 years. That's no longer the case. And so I think a lot of parents are trying to figure out how do I adjust and prepare my kids for this type of world. Now, this type of world is exciting. How exciting to have a podcast. How exciting to get to connect with you in Arizona all the way across the country. But in order to do that, we really have to pull ourselves out of this mindset of 
book work and book learning and six hours sitting in a chair and then coming home and doing homework because these types of things are not preparing our kids for the resiliency and the grit and the creativity that they're going to need in the world that they'll be launching in in 10, 20 years. Why is it so important for parents to encourage their kids to play outside, rain or shine, hot or cold, for at least 1,000 hours a year? Okay, so this comes from a lot of different things. But there's a woman named Angela Hanscom who wrote a book called Balanced and Barefoot. And she talks about, as a pediatric occupational therapist, that there is this threshold. Kids should be outside for about three hours a day, no matter their age. We're talking babies. We're talking teens. Get them outside. And you know, it's not realistic necessarily to get outside for three hours every single day. This is for adults, too. People join in on 1,000 hours outside with their dog. So you don't you could be a grandparent. You don't have to be a parent. But getting outside is helping our kids and it's helping us in the whole sense of our being. So what happens when we go outside is that we engage in complex movements. And complex movements enhance our brain function. So part of what's going on is cognition. We're helping our cognition through all these sensory experiences. When we go outside, we're helping our emotions. We're finding respite. You know, when you go outside, you can just ah, let it all go. And we're in a world that's tricky. A lot of times we're dealing with fear. We're dealing with uncertainty. We're dealing with this rapid change and how do we adjust. So that's going on. So we need something to ground us emotionally. It helps with social skills. Kim John Payne wrote a book called Simplicity Parenting. He says, the primary predictor of success and happiness in life, which is a huge statement, Alex, right? Like, I want to know what is the primary predictor of success and happiness in life? He says it's our ability to get along with others. And so when we spend time outside, a lot of times it's in a multi-age environment and we're learning those social skills physically. I mean, there is a list as long as I don't even know. You know, when when boys go outside and the sun hits their chest and back, it increases their testosterone. When we go outside, it lets our eyes relax. And so it helps with myopia, our joints and our lymphatic system. So our serotonin, our mood. So much is going on when we step outside physically. If parents are interested in spiritual growth, well, hey, the outdoors is a a, a physical a physical example of spiritual principles. We're talking about growth. We're talking about seeds and soil, all of these different things. And so when we take the time to step outside, and it doesn't have to be anything that is monumental. This is a walk around your neighborhood block. This is sitting on your porch for a meal. It's helping all of us in every facet of our development, our cognition, our emotions, our physical bodies, our social skills, and also our spiritual selves as well. Would you agree that many families treat time in nature as a luxury instead of a necessity? Yeah, I think they think it's frivolous. And, and that's what I thought too. Let me tell you what, that's, I do not come from a place of history where I was this pro outside person, get outside. What, what actually happened was that, Alex, I was struggling. I was struggling as a mother and we had these kids and I felt like, you know, my whole childhood and you enter into adulthood and you tend to do what you're good at. Every time I run out of my hydrating retinol moisturizer from Nimi Skincare, I can always tell my pores are just more clogged. I can literally feel the texture change in my skin. And faith, family, freedom, and femininity are at the core of everything Nimi Skincare does. Like, their values are amazing. So it says a lot that their products are even better. And you can get an entire three-step skincare routine for under $100 right now with code Alex Clark. And I always recommend the Daily Glow Up Routine. That's what it's called on their website, those three products under the Daily Glow Up Routine. You'll get the Hydrating Daily Cleanser and Toner, Hydrating Toner, Hydrating Cleanser to help brighten your skin complexion, add that extra hydration if you're dry like me. And then you've got the Retinol Lifting Moisturizer Cream, which will leave your skin feeling so refreshed and so smooth. And Nimi Skincare, it's paraben-free, it's cruelty-free, and it's handmade in the USA. We love to see that. You're going to see a noticeably more radiant complexion, visibly reduced fine lines and wrinkles thanks to that retinol. And by the way, speaking of the retinol, 
retinol in products like this moisturizer, I noticed for me, it really helps clear up any small breakouts that I get to. I've never had like major acne problems, but I definitely get clogged pores. And around certain times of the month, I can I can see, you know, I can see a little bit of breakout stuff going on. The daily glow up routine from Nimi is also great for producing collagen. Now, here's a big deal. Every year we lose 1% of our collagen as we age in our face. That is a significant difference. It's, it's I would say besides fine lines and wrinkles, your loss of collagen is going to show age more than anything else. And thanks to the resurfacing that you're going to get with Nimi's Retinol Moisturizer, your skin is going to feel so much smoother in texture, just like mine does. Try Nimi Skincare with 10% off your order by using code Alex Clark at NimiSkincare.com today. That's NimiSkincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off or click the link in the description. Nimi Skincare, modern skincare with timeless values. What was the struggle? Like, did you feel like you were just having a hard time connecting with your kids or what was going on? Well, I was feeling. I was feeling constantly. So I, I exited a world where, you know, I'm, I'm an administrator for this and I've done all of these things that I was really good at. I was accomplished at. I have these degrees. And then three days later, you know, here's my baby. And I, I mean, I failed even in my birth plan. So right from the beginning. And then he was crying and I didn't know what to do with him. And and then we had a couple more surprise. <laughs> and I've got these kids that are three under three. And I mean, every day I felt like a failure. Dawn to dusk, through the night, it never ended. And I was in a dark place because I wanted to love being a mom, but I wasn't loving being a mom because I was so overwhelmed by it. And getting outside, someone told me about it. There was this British educator from the 1800s, Alex, who said that kids should be outside for four to six hours a day whenever the weather is tolerable. I mean, that is not how we live here in America. We sign our kids up for this program and that program and this thing, and we're running from thing to thing, and it's so much output for everyone. And then you're exhausted. And so this person, you just read somebody talking about how like, hey, do you feel overwhelmed as a mother? Just go outside. And then what'd you do? Just stand in your yard. And then you're like breathing deep, like, okay, wait, this is <laughs> yeah, like well, a good yeah, step. Basically. <laughs> well, this is what happened. So Charlotte Mason is sort of this person that this guru that a lot of homeschoolers go to. She's got these six volumes of work. I've actually only read one of the six. And I was told about her by a friend. And the friend didn't tell me that Charlotte Mason was from the 1800s or I would have written it off. I didn't know. I mean, so why are we listening to someone from the 1800s? But people are still going to Charlotte Mason for a lot of parenting principles today. So this friend of mine, we had these little kids, Alex, and she says, hey, I, I want to try this. And I thought, that no, this is not going to go well. I'm thinking like, OK, my kids will play with Play-Doh for 15 minutes. We go to the library and and like the, everyone's crying and fussing and they, it's 45 minutes. So I'm thinking, go outside for four hours. That's not going to work. That's going to crash and burn. But this friend of mine, she says, let's try it. And literally what you said is what happened. We went to this park. This is in 2011 with a picnic lunch and a picnic blanket. And I'm like, what are these kids going to do for four hours? We met at nine. We're staying till 1 p.m. It's just no playground. Grass. There's no playground? <laughs> no, no playground. Just grass, a creek bed. And I sat on a picnic blanket with my girlfriend and we each had a baby and we nursed and the baby slept. And the older four kids, she had two, I had two, just ran around. They ran around. And I got to finish a conversation. I felt so at peace. And it was, this is the thing, it was the first good day I had as a mom. I had mm. been a mom for three years and had not had a good day yet. And it was the first good day I had. And so what happens is, is this is providing for everyone. It's providing for the newborn all the way through the grandparent the, the mother, the father, the aunt, the uncle, it helps everyone. Nature meets us where we're at, at our age and stage in life. Do you ever, Ginny, find it ironic that it was the internet ultimately that was the catalyst through you to encourage people to spend more time outside? I mean, isn't that how everyone's doing? Yeah, I mean, it, it totally is ironic. So I started off with a blog in 2013. Isn't that like what everybody did? I don't even know if you were alive then. You're like, you were probably a little kid. <laughs> no, I, was, I graduated high school in 2011. So you were doing your picnic with your friend and I was graduating high school. There we go. There we go. So I started off with a blog and then for a very long time, people thought, well, this is a really silly idea. But it caught on over the years. But yeah, definitely it has caught on 
through the internet. So it, it, this is about balance. Our kids have an Xbox and we do screens in our house. So we we are pro screen. I mean, I don't, you know, I think it's a tricky thing. I do. I'm very intrigued by the families that have no screen. In some ways, I wish we would have done that. Some families have no television, nothing. And I think that's really cool. But we didn't go that route from the beginning. We're trying to bring back balance. Kids are outside for four to seven minutes a day. These are the statistics. And they're on screens for four to seven hours. Oh, where it's imbalanced. And so why, it, it, explain the number, the timeline of one year. You didn't say, hey, 10 days a year outside. You said 1,000 hours a year outside. Why yeah. that number? Well, sure. So it, it goes with both things. It goes with this Charlotte Mason. She was four to six hours whenever the weather's tolerable. And Angela Hanscom, who's this pediatric occupational therapist, talking about the kids ideally could use three hours a day of outside play. And because I was a math major... I decided to add up how much time we were spending outside. And we were outside for about 1,200 hours a year. That matches the average screen time of American kids. And so I thought, well, what if we just brought back balance? You know, I could look back over the course of my life and think, okay, this last year we spent 1,200 hours outside. What a year. Like, what a fulfilling year. So many experiences, so many relationships that we built. All of this whole child growth is happening. I feel better and I would think, well, what if all that time had gone to screens, right? It's not about like, oh, we're anti-screen. It's about, no, I want to have a fulfilling life. I want to have a really good life. And I can only have that through balance. So it came from those numbers. Obviously, 1,000 hours outside is catchier than 1,200 hours outside. That's where it comes <laughs> from. But, you know, over the course of a year, we all go through things. We go through seasons figuratively and literally. I know you had Linda McGurk on your podcast. She talks about bad weather. And so there are seasons where hey, it's frigid out. Like I can't take my baby out in that weather or it's it's boiling hot. You're in Arizona. You know, it's 110 degrees. I can't take my baby out midday. Well, so, so that's, that's the season. thing. It's been, I think, for the last, I mean, at, at the time we're recording this, we just broke a record. It's been like 11 or 12 straight days of uh, like 118 degrees or higher. And so this is the thing. Any When I had Linda McGurk on and then talking to you, it's the, this question of like, OK, but if I live in an extreme weather place, super cold or super hot part of the year, how am I supposed to meet this goal of this certain amount of hours a day? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why we have a year long goal and not a daily goal. So that kind of answers your question, which is like, hey, look, you just had a baby. So you're going to be resting for a little bit or you just had a surgery or you're helping an ailing parent or, or you're you're just you're in grief. Like you, maybe you had a miscarriage or Something is going on in your life where you're grieving. You have a big work deadline. I mean, we all have these things that are in flux in our life. So our goal as a family is to get outside and to balance that nature time with screen time over the course of a year. And that makes up for these seasons that come up that are both figurative and literal. How long did it really take for this challenge to gain traction with the parenting community on social media? A long time, like six or seven years. But, you know, it's really about us just sharing our life like this worked for us and it has continued to work for us. And I think one of the tricky things about being in this stage of life where you're you're done with college, you enter the workforce, you become a parent. There's so much change. And as your babies grow, you constantly are figuring it out and then they change and it's change and it's that's constant and that's hard. But nature always works. And so it worked when I first started writing in 2013 and had little kids. And now I have teenagers and nature still works. We just went on this incredible trip. I went with my 13 year old daughter, five days rafting down the Green River in Utah, in Moab. What an experience. So it's like I used to carry her on my back while she cried and I was passing her suckers. And now we're rappelling off cliffs together. So it's neat to find something. And this will work till I'm a grandparent. This will won't ever not be a solution for a fulfilling life. Yeah. And so that's part of the reason I really love it. I had no idea that it had been 10 years, over 10 years since you started this. I had no idea. I thought this was a new thing because I came across this during the pandemic. Did you notice a huge explosion during the pandemic for this whole there was movement? Definitely a, yes, there was definitely growth during the pandemic because it gave people something to do and something to look forward to and something to strive for. That's for sure. When your family started really prioritizing outside time in such a dramatic or drastic way, what changes did you start to notice in your kids right away? 
immediately, here are the things, eating better, sleeping better, getting along better, and not getting sick. And I will tell you, since 2011, now this is a big statement, Alex, I have five kids. Since 2011, we have not needed a doctor's appointment. You are joking. Ever? That's like 50 years of life. No, not since 2011. Our kids were getting sick before then, going in for different things this day or the other, nothing. And you've got like 100 kids. Yeah, I got five kids. And <laughs> and what happens when they go outside is like it's moving their lymphatic system. It's that vitamin D. There is so much happening when we step outside. And so definitely their health. But what I learned and what I couldn't have known, what I learned is that when kids engage in complex movements outside, so they start to toddle, they're working on varied environments outside. It's not flat like your carpeted living room. They're climbing trees. They're climbing over fences. All of these complex movements lay this neural network down in their brain and the myelination increases and their brains work better. So there's this book by Dr. Carla Hannaford called Smart Moves, Why Learning is Not All in Your Head. She's also a pediatric occupational therapist. And she has this statistic in there that says elderly people who dance regularly have a 76% less chance of developing dementia. 76% less chance of developing dementia. I want that. And it's because the dancing is complex movement, like movement affects our brains. And so that's what I couldn't have known back when our kids were young. And, And that's something that you can really measure. But I have learned since then that that's what's going on on the inside there, that when they're rolling, when they're roughhousing, all of this is contributing to their development. I thought this was really funny, Ginny. I I told someone recently about your challenge. I said, oh, I'm going to be talking to this woman. She created this 1,000 hours outside challenge for for a year. And they were like, okay, I'm on board. But what do you do outside? Like, what do you do? So, Ginny, there are people who are like a deer in the headlights when you tell them, hey, you need to start spending more time in nature. Where should the true couch potato start if they want (laughs) to attempt this challenge? All right. The true couch potato should call up a friend and get some good snacks and go on a hike. That's what the couch potato should do. Because once you're out on a hike, you are stuck. And I think that's a great way to start. No one's coming to airlift you out. You got to make it to the end and you're there together. If you have young kids, call up a friend. Same thing. Go with a friend. It's safer. You're going to have that community. Your kids are going to have other kids to play with. It really makes a difference. Bring some good snacks and find a place where you can do a half mile hike a one mile hike. If you've got little kids, they're going to get distracted by all of the surroundings and you're going to see how nature engages them. And you, I mean, sometimes we take a two mile hike with our little kids. It takes the full day, the whole day. Because they want to stop and look and pick up rocks. And play. Yeah. And do all of those different things. That's where I think you should start is, is that type of thing. But you can really do anything. Why don't you start with taking your breakfast outside? Because when you go outside in the morning, the sunlight goes through your eyes, right to your brain, and your brain releases serotonin. That makes you feel good. So we should be getting outside in the morning. And then the serotonin, it turns into melatonin at night. What a thing. So you could have happy kids in the morning and sleepy kids at night. This is what we all want, right? So take your take your meals outside. Take your schoolwork outside. Take your book outside. Take your board games outside. All of these simple things really matter We're getting exposed to that full spectrum of sunlight, and it does so much for our mental health and our physical health. What does the concept of a slow childhood mean to you? It means giving kids the time to learn who they are. We have to have that time. I wrote a blog post a long, long time ago that said we're stealing time from children. And I think we're doing it out of a place of of a good intentions. We really want to give them every opportunity. But what they need is they need time to be able to dig into themselves and figure out what to do with their boredom. They need to figure out what it is in the world that makes them excited. And all the kids are different. We got one kid that's interested in guitar and one kid that's interested in basketball. They just have these different interests and they wax and they wane and they change. But we are co-opting childhood. We have taken almost all of it. And we certainly have taken the best parts of it. We have taken the eight to four. When our oldest son was getting ready for school, school age, he was five. Now we homeschool. But our reason, our initial reason to homeschool was because the bus showed up at eight in the morning and it didn't come back till 445 in the afternoon, age five. 
That is the best part of childhood right there. That day and they come home and they're exhausted and they have dinner and now they're giving these kids homework and they go to bed and they get very short recess times. I worked in the schools and I saw that all of this time it wasn't going for enrichment. It was going for academics and they do not need it at those ages. In fact, in fact, John Taylor Gatto wrote a book called Dumbing Us Down. It's a good title. He was a public school edu- educator. And he says in his book, that that book and other books, that at the right age and stage, it only takes kids 50 hours to learn functional literacy. So like they could learn to read, write, and do math so that they could learn anything else they ever wanted to learn. 50 hours. And yet we're taking thousands of hours out of our kids' childhood for just academics. That's it. What about the rest of them? Yeah, I had Heidi St. John, a mutual friend of ours, on uh, mm-hmm. in the last couple months to talk all about homeschooling and busting myths on homeschooling and stuff. And that is, uh, she she was very passionate about that as well. But I always tell people who say, well, I can't homeschool and everything. I don't have the time because I work or things like that. I'm like, you only have to homeschool. Like, one to two hours a day even. And you have all yeah. this other time. Like you you do not have to be locked to this six, seven, eight hour day of work. Right. Can you find 50 hours over the course of elementary school? I mean, that, and then they're, then they're off. They, you know, and I was nervous about it. This is different than how I grew up, obviously. So we're nervous and we don't want to screw up our kids. We got these knocking knees. And I remember this one time we, we learned to read or some learned to read. He's older, seven you know, so a second grader, not kindergarten. And I'm nervous. Like, am I going to mess things up? And then I remember going somewhere and we're at a nature center and we're talking about the kind of snakes that live there with one of the workers. And then he starts spouting off all these facts. He knew more he than the other he... kids. Yes. And he's and I'm like, I don't know any of that stuff. And he knew it because he said he read it. And I thought, well, this is the point is that there are millions of things of value to study and we can give our kids more time than they're currently getting. That's a slow childhood. Why is it important to let your kids do something in free play that seems a little odd or strange? Like you see them doing something, you're like, okay, that's weird. Should I step in? But why should you not step in? (laughs) That's all weird. Well, Dr. Peter Gray wrote a book called Free to Learn, and he said kids are biologically wired to self-educate. They're biologically wired. That's how they come into the world. They're here to educate themselves. And so the things that they do have a purpose. They are worthy. The kid is trying to learn something and we don't know what that is. And that's scary. There's this quote by John Holt, who was a homeschooling kind of guru. My favorite book of his is called Learning All the Time. And he says, when kids are living happily happily and energetically and fully, they are living, they are learning a lot. Let me say that again. When kids are living happily and energetically and fully, they are learning a lot even if we don't always know what it is. And I think that's the trade-off. Like we give our kids and we give ourselves. That's how we should live too. Give yourself a full life. It doesn't really matter exactly what you're learning. If we can't test it, if we can't check it off some sort of a box, we know that they're learning and that's the point. What has your family done in nature lately that might seem really mundane, but you actually had a blast? Yeah, it's all mundane for the most part. So we walk fairly regularly across the street, across, there's this neighborhood that we walk in. It is so boring. It is flat. It's a one mile. So we're trying to hit a certain mileage goal this year. I'm way behind my kids. They're way ahead of me. But we walk and then sometimes we see bunnies and one tree has mulberries and that's it. And we do it on a fairly regular basis and we have good conversations and we pump up our music and it's so mundane, but it's still really fulfilling. And still important and still has great benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, for millennials growing up and having our own families now, a lot of us, we were the first generation to have any type of screen time. And so some of us maybe didn't grow up going outside ourselves very much. How can you become an adventurous mom if you weren't an adventurous kid? I was not an adventurous kid. So I was inside. I was reading. I was playing the piano. And I think the point is that adventure doesn't have to look like climbing a mountain. It doesn't look like kayaking down a whitewater river. It doesn't look like that. Adventure looks like anything that is outside of your normal routine. And what happens when you do things outside of your normal routine is that you remember it. You remember it better and it makes your life feel longer and more fulfilling. So when we go on a boring walk around the neighborhood across the street and we see a bunny, that's out of our normal routine. When we see a cardinal, 
when we wave at our neighbors and have a little conversation. And so if you're a mom that's feeling like, okay, I don't like the bugs, I don't like the heat, I don't like the cold, you want to start small and just try a couple things. Go on the hike, get stuck out there. And what you'll start to do is you'll start to build up some grit. You'll start to build up some resilience for it. I mean, this nature is unpredictable. The rest of our life is fairly predictable. And we want to be in these situations that are a little uncomfortable. They help us to grow in, in, as people. Michael Easter's got a great book about that called The Comfort Crisis. So if going outside and taking a walk in the, in the nearby forest is adventurous to you, that's an adventure. And so you start there and you grow. Is the 1,000 hours outside challenge something a family can start no matter how old their kids are? Absolutely. Yes. It's And you can do it even if you don't have a family or even if your kids are grown and now you're a grandparent and your dog can be a 1,000 hours outside dog. I mean, it really does not matter. Nature is for everyone from the newborn all the way up through end of life. How does a parent leave their kids with a legacy of connection to creation? Ooh, well, we have to go outside in it, right? We have to go outside. You know, I remember as a kid, I, I've always loved the Bible. I loved it even since I was really young. And I remember reading these verses in Deuteronomy that talk about when we parent and when we walk by the way, that we should be talking about spiritual principles to our kids. And I remember thinking like that sounds a little contrived or boring. But in the last decade, as we've spent more time outside, what you see is you see this depiction of God's hand woven everywhere. And so it makes it a place where you can really have those deep conversations with your kids as they get older. So here's an example. You can go and you can find monarch caterpillars. It's underneath the milkweed. And you look underneath and it's like adult hide and seek. The kids love to do it. And you find these little caterpillars and they are green and yellow. And they start so small, you can hardly see them. And then they get to be pretty big in just a couple weeks. You're feeding them these leaves. They're pooping in the container. You're cleaning it out. And then in just a couple weeks, they form into this emerald green. They shed their skin and they're this emerald green chrysalis with these gold dots that swirl around and they're beautiful and they harden up a little bit. You could hang them around your house on little strings. And then a couple weeks from then, that chrysalis will turn black and you can kind of see inside and it's black and it's orange. And then all of a sudden, out comes a butterfly and you had a green and yellow caterpillar that is now an orange and black butterfly and it tastes with its feet and it has a proboscis and you can tell if it's male or female, it's got dots on the wings and it's so exciting. And the Bible says, we are new creatures in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. And so God has given us all of these physical physical ways to teach our kids these incredible spiritual principles. And so when we're out in nature, we see those things and we can use those as a way to help our kids remember that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies show the work of his hands and all of the symbiosis and the variety, all of these things can be used to teach our children and, and to connect them to their creator. You've created a bunch of ways for, for families to be able to keep track of their hours. So you can do like a, a piece of paper that you print out that you color in. You also have a digital app that they can download and, and log it that way. Now, how tiring is it to always get asked, well, does it count if I'm in a pool? Does it count if I'm in a tent? Uh, what if we're on concrete? So let's settle this once and for all, Ginny. What counts and what doesn't towards your 1,000 <laughs> <Okay>. hours? <laughs> Yes, because this has become like my full time job. And I was actually talking to a person this morning for a podcast. And he said, now, would you count indoor basketball as outside time? No, I know <laughs> you said indoor basketball. So here's what we count. Now, listen, this is not about being dogmatic. This is about a lifestyle change. It's about celebrating whatever time you can put toward hands on real life moments. If you are a single parent and you cannot get outside for 1000 hours, that is not a big deal. You just do what you can, but by having a goal, by being intentional, it's going to change your life. This is a simple premise with a profound impact. Whether you hit 1,000 or you hit 600, and some families are doing way more than us, they're at 2,000. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter the exact minutes and numbers that you come in. So part of it is just knowing, like, chill, it's okay. 
it, you know, it doesn't have to be, I was driving to the zoo and my windows were down and can I count that on my chart? No. <laughs> okay, you cannot. You cannot. So we just say, well, for our family, we say nature above and nature below. So that does not include your tent. Wow. It doesn't really include your garage with the door open. So nature above, nature below. I mean, maybe you want to include your porch. I mean, it, <laughs> it's just a thing. So it's never been a thing with strict rules, although people do ask a lot. Like, So here's an interesting question that we've gotten asked a lot, Alex. Someone will say, what if I'm walking around the block and my baby is in the stroller? Does that count? Yes. Like, yes, it really counts because all of that full spectrum light and all that surround sound of nature that they're hearing, hearing, that all matters. That all is worth something. So we definitely get asked the does it count question all the time. (laughs) And I should start charging for my answers. Yeah, you should. You should. You got to do a little frequently. You probably already have it, but a frequently asked questions thing. Now, what happens if you forget to track for a couple months? Does that mean you failed that year or can you start over? You explode. (laughs) (laughs) You you spontaneously combust. (laughs) Life spirals out of control. I don't know. People estimate they start over. It doesn't matter. You can join in any time. It's meant to be fun. And it really works for some people. And it also doesn't work for some people. Some people are a little too uptight and it doesn't really work for their personality. And so the conversation is, this is good for you. And it cannot be the thing that we leave as a leftover thing for our leftover time. It has to be one of the foundational pieces of family life in childhood. That's the conversation. And for us, we have a goal for it because it's kind of a pain. Like, I like to be inside. There's no bugs in here. I can keep the temperature 70 degrees. And I have all sorts of things I love to do inside. I want, I, you know, I could clean my house forever. I could clean forever. There's always something else that you can do while you're inside. And so it's a push. We have to get over that threshold. We have to get over the doorstep. And that's why we have a goal, because it is actually a hard thing to do, and especially hard in a world that's filled with technology. I mean, when we were kids, and you may not have experienced this, but when I was a kid, it was like at noon, the cartoons went off on Saturday. And so I had to find something else to do. I had no other choice. Well, now, I mean, there's constantly streaming content. So kids could u- utilize that for their whole life. It's harder now for them to, to pull them away from it. But it is important. And it's a tall order, but it's an order that, you know, it's fallen on the, the shoulders of the parents and the teachers and the community that our kids need this and they need to have hands-on experiences so they know what analog life is like. What has been the most emotional encounter that you've had with someone whose life has been radically changed by this challenge? Well, you know, Alex, it is really wild. I speak around the country and people come up sobbing. I mean, sobbing. Because mothering is really hard and life is really hard and they come up sobbing and I relate because I was also in that desperate position, that desperate position of really wanting to enjoy these kids in front of me, but really struggling to do so. And so a lot of people come up sobbing just about that life change. A lot of people come up talking about periods of grief in their life, like they're struggling with infertility, they had a miscarriage, they lost their mother, and they will talk about how nature held them through some really dark days, some really dark times. And then recently I had someone come up to me and tell me that they sold their house and they bought a plot of land in the country with no house because of our podcast. And I was what? like, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I hope that works out for them. That kind of stuff I has don't happened really to me. Know where I suggested that, but I had okay. a I mean, I always tell people like don't I mean, and this is me and my audience, uh, but like I always tell people like don't put up with beliefs uh, in your corporate workplace that you vehemently disagree with. You know, Um, if it it compromises your principles, like then you need to leave. So one girl came up to me to uh, conference and was like, I don't have another job picked out yet, but I just quit my job yesterday because of you. And I'm like, ah, (laughs) but I think she's okay. But yeah, people say that kind of stuff. And it's, it's very interesting to hear how like our podcasts really impact people. And um, I mean, so that's this movement you've created, but you also have this podcast where you interview all of these experts and pioneers in the parenting space. And I tell everyone that your podcast is one of my favorites of all time um, because you. you interview people like puppeteers and child psychologists and librarians and grief and nature experts, basically anyone whose specialty is working with children. And it was your show that I first heard the brain is designed 
to remember shocking things. What does that mean? Wow, isn't that incredible? Well, I think that that came through a talk about pornography. And Kristen Jensen came on and was talking about that's the dark side of technology. So, you know, we talk about technology and actually there's really interesting conversations about promise versus peril that technology has arrived and we are not as fulfilled as we thought we would be. It has not given us the better life that we thought it would give. And one of the dark sides is exposure to pornography and that kids are getting exposed to pornography at younger and younger ages through screens and through screen media. And so that's one of the things that she says is that our brains are designed that you see that shocking image and that's going to stick with you for a lifetime. I think it also works on the positive side for awe that when you see something that is so striking and and so different from what you normally see that it tends to be something that you remember as well. But it's one of those things that reminds us that there are actual dangers when it comes to technology. And so the less time that you're around screens and the more time you're filling your life with other things, the less chances are that you may come across those types of things. I am absolutely fascinated by the parents I know who say that by changing their kid's diet and switching to no dyes, no artificial flavors, and whole foods only, they have seen a dramatic change in their kid's behavior. Since 2011, it is recorded by the National Library of Medicine and Public Record that food dyes are linked to harmful effects in children. Artificial dyes have neurotoxic chemicals that aggravate mental health problems. And so when families with autistic children avoid food dyes in their diet, a lot of them say that they see this massive decrease in behavioral issues. And studies correlate yellow dye in particular, with sleep disturbance. Food colors blue one and two, green three, red three, yellow five and six, citrus red two, and red 40. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, but all of those can trigger a myriad of negative behaviors in most kids. And you may not know this, but I'm a CASA volunteer with foster kids. And the little girl that's on my case currently, she has significant trauma. And so when her placement eliminated food dyes and artificial flavors and colors, they told me they're like, Alex. Well, they said, Miss Alex. The tantrums decreased dramatically, and I was able to include that in my court report for the judge for this child. Double-checking the ingredients in every snack, salad dressing, and juice that we drink is equally important to how we look at controlling weight because it can be controlling your emotions. And this is why I switched to Squeezed Juice. That's their name, Squeezed Juice, five flavors, 100% juice, never from concentrate, no water added, non-GMO, and all-natural juice juice, fresh, squeezed in California and shipped on dry ice straight to your door. It is so fast that if you snap your fingers, it'll be there. And if you want juice squeezed fresh in your kitchen, but you just don't have the time or the patience to do it, I get it. Try squeezed juice. Their ingredient lists look like this. Mandarins, pomegranates, ginger, carrots, turmeric, strawberries, matcha, cucumber, and more. Nothing shady, just whole ingredients fresh squeezed, shipped directly to you from a conservative-owned family farm in California. Get rid of the Capri Suns and start packing squeezed juice in your kids' lunches. Click the link in the show notes and use code ALEX for 25% off. Right now, go to shop.squeezejuice.com with code ALEX for 25% off. That's shop squeezejuice.com with code Alex for 25% off. What has been your most popular episode to date? Oh, I love that question. I always ask other people that too. Uh, Our most popular episode is with Kim John Payne. And the episode is called uh, The Undeclared War on Childhood. And he says we're living in the undeclared war on childhood. And what's super interesting about it, Alex, is he talks about how we're all kind of quirky. Like we all have our quirks. So some kids are really organized and and we have these different quirks. And he says what happens is that when we have stress, our stress starts to accumulate in our amygdala. So it starts to accumulate. It's this accumulated stress. And what's happening with children is that they're not having a chance to release their stress. And so it's building and it's building. And he says it's tipping them into disorder when really they just be kind of this cute, quirky kid. And he said, you can bring it back. But the way that you bring it back is you have to turn down the tap. Like you cannot be pouring so much into our kids' lives. So he talks about how during the day, kids are meant to play. And when they play, their body releases neurotoxins. That's part of what's happening when they play. It's not frivolous. It is so important for their well-being. 
that they have downtime. It's important for our well-being that we have a downtime. And so his is up there. I had on Stephen Ranella, who has the show Meat Eater. His is up near the top. And he talks about his book is called Outdoor Kids in an Inside World. And he has some really fun ideas about well, and he talks about just like the hard parts of it. Like I'm fighting with my wife and she thinks we should bring these clothes. And some people were like, ew, why are we talking about this? And I'm like, this is really what's happening. That's real life. We're having Yeah, when you go outside, you have to make a lot more decisions than you would have had to when you stayed inside. And sometimes you make the wrong ones. Sometimes you have a really awful time. That happens. And so that's part of it is that you have these different struggles. And so his is one of the top ones, too. Two people that you've interviewed that you say have changed your life that also have changed mine. Um, And I love their books, too. And I've also interviewed them on my show. Linda McGurk, we talked about There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather. She wrote that book. And then Dr. Nicholas Cardaris, who wrote Glow Kids. Mm-hmm. obsessed with both of yeah. them. Um, I wanted Did you read to, Digital Madness? Um, I have that on my in my TBR shelf, okay. um, but I haven't read it yet. Okay, but that one's really, really good too because he wrote Glow Kids. I mean, that book is 10 years old. That's, yeah. that's an older book. But he wrote Digital Madness. Bump it up your list okay. because he wrote that one in response to, okay, now we understand that these digital things are really affecting us, that the video games are trying to lift our blood pressure and our galvanized skin response and all of that stuff. That's in Glow Kids. But in Digital Madness, he talks about, well, what should our response be? Now that we're here, how do we deal with it? It's a phenomenal read. Okay. I also have to tell you, if you've not read, you need to read Take Back Your Family, Jefferson Bethke. Have you read that yet? Oh, I haven't, but I know of him, and that would be incredible. Okay, Take Back Your Family, so good, because that's about uh, how important multi-generational living is and how uh, oh. that was actually God's original design for family. So, yeah. like, I feel like we always hear, like, the nuclear family is the best, the nuclear family, but actually it isn't. The You were supposed to have a multi-generational family living together, and I loved his book. Um, and then— Okay, wait, I'm coming back. Okay, <laughs> Hunt, Gather, Parent yes. is by Michaeline Duclef. And I just talked to her literally this morning. But when you're talking about the nuclear family, she had a statement in her book that said mothers should never be alone with crying babies. What a statement. I cannot tell you how many hours I spent alone with crying babies, more than one crying baby. And so when you talk about that multi-generational living, Joel Salatin talks about that, too. He's got a farm in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. And what a beautiful picture of his mother lives there. She's almost 100. He lives there. I'm not sure how old he is, but he's a grandpa. So there's four generations living there. And what a beautiful life that is. Absolutely. And then I'll, I have to tell you, just because like you're my favorite podcast, so I have to tell you why I have you. The other interview you did that is uh, not only one of my favorite interviews of yours, but I also ended up getting the book after one of my favorite parenting books is uh, Free Range Kids by Lenore oh, so Skenazy Skenazy. But oh, she's you, hilarious. Dude, so funny. And I, you said in the interview, you're like, I laughed out loud reading your book and I was laughing out loud. But I, I have to know, was she one of your co- most controversial guests you ever had? Because I have flirted with my listeners yeah. this idea of free range parenting. And it's not very popular. It's so interesting. I don't know. I, nothing's really been all that controversial. So no one really said anything about it. And I think that the point of Lenore's is that Kids, here's the thing. Okay, so Lenore, she writes her book. Her book is about, I don't know, she sent her nine-year-old on the subway. He was 10, nine or 10. Okay, she did that. She writes this free-range kid. Well, she teamed up with Dr. Peter Gray, who wrote Free to Learn. So Dr. Peter Gray ends his book. Here's the story. He sent his kid to Europe. His son wanted to go to Europe for two weeks. He was super into Dungeons and Dragons. His son came to him and said, I'll I'll work. I'll pay for the ticket. I'll figure everything out. Now, this is in the 80s. There's no Internet. His son was a type one diabetic. And so they were kind of nervous about his health. But he was so determined that the parents let him go. And he was 13. <gasps> oh, everyone listening is gasping. 13 years old, go to 13. Europe by yourself and you're diabetic and all this? Two weeks, no no cell phone. They said he called home collect twice. When was this? What year? In the 80s. It happened okay. in the 80s. And he said that it was a little controversial then, but not too much. But so Jenny, like, what do you think he would say now in 2023? Do you think that he would still feel confident in 2023 letting a 13-year-old gallivant across Europe alone? <laughs> no, probably not. And I did actually ask him, how would you parent today if... Your, if you were a parent right now, 
And he kind of skirted around the question, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. See, that's the thing people <laughs> but, say. Like, I would have done this stuff in the 80s or 90s, but I wouldn't do it now. Yeah. Well, and I think there's just, you know, there's balance. You got to find balance. So, for example, I had just read his book and just talked to him. And we were at a theme park. So you grew up in Indiana. I'm not sure if you ever went to Cedar Point. Of course That's in I Ohio. did. So yes, over, Sandusky. Yes. So, all right, so over in the Midwest. And we're at Cedar Point. It's closed in. And I'm there. And on a group of teenagers, including my son, are doing their own thing. And I kept thinking, I should check in. I wonder if he's OK. I wonder if he's got food. And then I kept thinking, wait a minute. Like, Peter Gray sent his kid to Europe. I'm like, I can chill out. So I think sometimes those stories just allow us, at least in these smaller moments, to chill out. Like it's not that big of a deal, especially in comparison to some of these other stories. All right. So as we wrap up, you have said that your goal ultimately is that for this 1,000 hours outside movement to be obsolete, why would you say that about such a beautiful thing that you created? The ideal is that this would just be a part of our life, right? This would just be a part of our lifestyle. And I think that it may not ever get there just because of the influence of technology, but maybe it will. And I think there are a lot of families who say, look, I kept track for a year. We took the chart. It's free online. We blew it up. We put it on our wall. Our kids colored it in. And by the next year, we didn't need to do it because we had already changed our lifestyle so radically that we know we're getting the amount of outside time in that we need. And so here, so we talk about things being obsolete. When I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, no one paid attention to the time that they spent outside because kids just did it naturally, even though I was an indoor kid. That's what I would consider myself. But we had recess. We had a couple recesses. I walked a mile to school. It was a mile home. We played baseball with my dad when he would get home from work. So we spent time outside. It was natural. It was a natural part of the childhood environment, and it's not anymore. So if we could get back to that place where it's a natural part of the child environment, then I'm going to have to change my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might have to. Oh, this is going to gross you out. Did you know that ground beef is the most recalled and contaminated meat sold in America? That's because it's often made up of meat coming from dozens of sources and countries and all being blended together. All you end up with is trouble and really lackluster flavored ground beef. Good Ranchers ground beef is 100% American, made from Angus cattle, and they're never given antibiotics or hormones. And that's not just better ground beef, okay? That's the best best ground beef in the country. And right now it's completely free. You can get free ground beef from Good Ranchers today for two whole years by subscribing today. That is a $480 value. Good Ranchers is the only meat company that promises to lock in your price for two years when you sign up. This is the best meat in America with zero inflation. What more could you want than that? No other meat company offers you this kind of savings on 100% American meat with a locked in price. That's because no one else is conservative owned and operated like Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Clark with code Clark for 25 $5 off and $480 worth of free ground beef in your first two years. That's goodranchers.com slash Clark with code Clark for over $500 in savings and two pounds of free ground beef in every box for two years. Find the link in the show notes, ditch the meat aisle and subscribe to Good Ranchers. American meat delivered. I mentioned earlier that there are people that are overwhelmed with this idea of going outside because they don't know what they could do. But the good thing is, is that you wrote an entire book with ideas of what to do outside. Yeah. So tell us about your book and then um, your podcast and how often you release new episodes. <laughs> OK, well, here's the thing. I am not very good at this. So I actually have three books all called 1000 Hours Outside. And <laughs> they're, Jenny! All different. <laughs> they're all different. Whoops. What? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> So that's kind of what happened. That's a thing. I don't know. It just all of a sudden, that's the third one. The one that you have there is actually the third one. It came out in December with DK Publishings and people sent photos from all over the world. It's a very cool book. It's filled with ideas. So if you're feeling like, look, hiking is not going to cut it for me or it's in the middle of the winter and I don't know what to do with my kid. That one is filled with ideas. And you'd be surprised how fun, simple, hands-on nature things can be. They're very engaging, even for your teenagers. So that's the third 1,000 Hours Outside book. They all have different subtitles. I have a new book coming out in November that has its own 
title. Oh, so thank this is God. super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I what's, moved away. What's that it's one going to be about? It, this is the book I've always wanted to write. It's called Until the Streetlights Come On, How a Return to Play Brightens Our Today and Prepares Kids for an Uncertain Future. So it's about how we can have a good today and a good tomorrow. We don't have to sacrifice today on the altar of tomorrow, preparing kids for college when they're two years old. We can really have full lives today. And really, that's for anyone. That's for me. That's for you. A full life today, I think, is what is what ultimately prepares us for the best day tomorrow. So live fully. That's coming out in November. And we have an app. Everything's all called the same name, 1000 Hours Outside. My podcast sometimes has one episode a week and sometimes it has four. Same thing. I'm, I'm not very good at it, but we plug away. I'm passionate. I'm passionate about it. So, I mean, we got these five kids at home. We're homeschooling. I travel. And so I try to live by the philosophy of living fully today. What can I do? What can we put out in the world? What do I need to let go? And just trust that that's enough. Yeah, you're so busy. And so I just can't thank you enough for um, generously donating some time to us uh, on The Spillover. Thank you, Ginny, for coming on. So thrilled to be here. Thanks, Alex. Well, this episode may have been a bucket list item for me, but it's definitely my bank account's least favorite because my Amazon cart is obscene right now with all Ginny's book recommendations that now I have to buy. Thanks, Ginny. If you liked this episode, then go back, listen to my interview that I referenced with Linda McGurk. She's the one who wrote There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather. It's all about Scandinavian parenting, which is one of my favorite things to learn about, like how they believe in leaving your baby outside to sleep, even in a public place like a restaurant. It's very fascinating, and it really shows the contrast between American parenting culture and how I think we often parent out of fear versus how other countries do things. That's, I mean, think about that. Like leaving your baby outside of a restaurant while you are inside eating in their stroller, you would never do that here. People get arrested for that here. That is season four, episode 16. Can't miss it. My guest next week is known for being the godfather of memes. That is a big hint. Some of you are going to be able to figure it out just from that. He is one of the most popular families on social media, biggest Twitters in the world. He worked for Tucker Carlson and Andrew Breitbart before anyone really knew who they were. We discussed the deficit of young conservative men seeing the reward in the risk of marriage because marriage is a risk, but You have to go into it thinking like, well, the reward outweighs the risk, right? But a lot of guys aren't doing that. And we also talk about why some weirdos online think dads shouldn't help change diapers. Yeah, this is a new discourse on social media. And what women are doing wrong when it comes to finding a husband. Every week is a new interview with a unique guest or expert with an incredible story. So subscribe and leave a five-star review to support us and let us know how we're doing. The Spillover is back next Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's the same time and same day every week. And you have the option to watch every single episode by subscribing to Real Alex Clark on YouTube, where you'll also find a boatload of other videos and content from me. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you. Mean it. Bye. 